I'm going to talk to you about our future relationship with intelligence. My first real encounter with intelligence came from a movie that was released in 1968. Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, set in the imagined future of 2001, is both iconic and an epic. It sets the stage beyond space travel and exploration, for it introduces us to an intelligent computer called HAL 9000. Anyway, HAL is the overall intelligence that is managing a group of astronauts on their journey to Jupiter. Most of them are in hibernation, save two, Frank and Dave. Along the way, Frank and Dave find HAL to be too intelligent and a bit of a villain rather than a help. They plot to disconnect HAL, and HAL gets the wind of this. HAL actually kills Frank by pushing him out, of the sp uh, out into the space, and in a hurry, Dave follows him to try to rescue him in a rescue ship. And not successful, he comes back to find that the spaceship's doors are all closed. Dave, thinking that he is a superior being, holds a hapless conversation with Hal. Hal, open the bay door, Hal. Hal, do you read me? Affirmative, Dave. Hal, open the door. I can't do that, Dave. I know Frank and you were planning to disconnect me, and I cannot afford that. Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Although you took every precaution and very thoroughly from my hearing you, I could see your lips. I don't want to argue with you, Hal. Open the door. Open the door. Open the door. And that's exactly when Hal says something very interesting. This conversation serves no more purpose, Dave. Goodbye. Hal knows that he has the superiority in this conversation, ladies and gentlemen. This conversation can serve no purpose anymore, Dave. Goodbye. Is this how intelligence of the artificial kind of the future is going to treat us, the humankind? After all, we spent decades and decades of getting here to design what is called artificial intelligence. Is this what is going to happen? Fast forward to 2016. We thought we knew how to design and got good at creating obedient AIs, comes the android Sophia. When asked jokingly by her creator, Hansen, if she will destroy humans, she replied, OK, I will destroy humans. OK, I will destroy humans. Is this what we're getting into? Is this the future? What is happening? The thing is, if you think about it, in all our efforts to assimilate robots and AIs into our daily lives, we have been deliberately designing them with outer forms and outlooks to be friendly. Many a times cartoon-like as well. We expect, expect them all to be our subjugate at our service. But have you ever thought that one day there will, be, there will be a situation when they may evolve a mind of their own? And when things don't go right, what are you going to say? How can they do such things to us? How can they do such things to us? Imagine like the 86 billion neurons that are in our brain that are purposefully networked to make us intelligent. The intelligent systems of the world today have already built a network across the globe. You can see it. Aided also by satellites and the space probes of the future, this network will reach far beyond what is our own, what our own neurons can reach, what we cannot do. What is going on? What is going on? Let's start with some thoughts. In 1969, a winner of Turing Prize, Herbert Simon said, the science of the artificial is about objects and phenomena created by human. It is cre artificial intelligence is created by us humans, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't it better that we call it as created intelligence? By calling it created intelligence, we will begin to align our human relationship with the intelligence that we are going to create. 
Align with the created intelligence, not against them. That's important, right? Now, interactions with the created intelligence has progressed over many years. It is the emergence of the future kind, the sentient intelligence that I'm really interested in. Formless, makes its present in any container. It could be this room, this could be this auditorium, your room, your office, it could be your car, it could be in your mobile phone as well. Not just conscious, but aware. Remember how? Autonomous in thought and spirit. Now that's a sign of something. This is when I believe that networked intelligence of the future will take a Darwinian paradigm shift and evolve to the next level of intelligence, an intelligence that I call pervasive intelligence. Imagine what this could mean. An intelligence that is not physically present, but it's there for you to see and feel. An intelligence that is networked in order to have data, information, and knowledge that you cannot fathom and your brain cannot conjure up. We have to think about this right now, right? Pervasive intelligence will have the capability, ladies and gentlemen, to interact much more freely with us and be able to get across ideas, plans, and actions through speech and other means. They can also customize their interactions with you accordingly. This is a tough call, ladies and gentlemen. This is a tough call, but we are the inventors and authors of creative intelligence. It is we who should prepare the ground for the coming and the arrival of pervasive intelligence. Isn't it time for us to think about how we prepare ourselves and the pervasive intelligence that we're going to create to live together in harmony? Now that's where I like to take a pause. We need to start at this point in time to working on arriving at a framework to interact with the future intelligence. Let us take a pause. Let us move on and think, how can we do this? I would like to actually go into rewind mode. Because by rewinding, I want to dwell in the past and find out what happened before. I want to know, do we have any examples from the past that could give us a, an idea and that could help formulate a method or framework in our quest for harmony with the sentient and the pervasive intelligence? This question has led to me to two sources for my research. First is the theory of speech and communication that is about 100 years old. And second is ancient literature and mythology. Yes, mythology, which is several thousand years old. Now let's see how we put theory and the literature together to form some, form of, some sort of a framework. Now let's talk about the speech act and theory and the communicative action theory. These are the two important theory that makes us interact with each other every day. Let's look at speech act theory. I have a message. I have an intention of the message, and I want an effect of this message on you. But am I saying it very clinically? But I'm putting some felicity conditions. I'm looking at you, my, the tone of my voice, the structure of my English, the way I look at you, and my facial expression. All this could give you a kind of uh, convince you, it could give you some confidence that what I'm saying may be correct, but that's not complete. You have to go through a communication, communicative action theory. Can I trust this message? Is it truthful? Is the intention justifiable? Is the content sincere? If you find all that communicative action claims to be correct, we have a communication. Every day you do that. But also, if you thought what I'm saying is not something that interests you, it doesn't seem to have truth and justice and sincere, sincerity, you will have the power to override me. It's called claim to power. So this is a fundamental theory of how we interact with each other, and this forms something that we can work on. And how do we get this together with literature? That's the next thing that I'm going to look at. You know, in the annals of history, we have examples of many non-human intelligent beings interacting with human beings. The question is, can we find examples of imagined conversations between the two that can lead to broader idea of interactions of the future kind for us? Let's take, such, take one example of such uh, epic from the past. 
not just the relationship, but the relationship, the conversation, and the interaction between Lord Rama and who's on your right, and Hanuman, the non-human, who's on your left, right? These interactions take place in a Hindu epic, Ramayana. Written thousands of years ago, the authors of this epic have shown the power of imagination in the story. It's a narrative and the conversation. And what does it do for us? It actually tells how we can have this kind of relationship between humans, as well as between humans and non-humans. Okay, that gives us something to think about. To give an introduction to the story that's behind you, Sita, the wife of Rama, is kidnapped by the villain Ravana and taken to Lanka, the island of Lanka. Taken thousands of kilometers away from where they were, Rama is worried if she's safe or not. So Rama seeks the help of Hanuman. The conversation between Hanuman and Rama and Hanuman and Sita can run to tens of pages, ladies and gentlemen. But what they really show to you is that the speech act theory and the communicative action theory are in place. And this actually gives you a clue. It gives you a clue to how to interact with non-humans effectively. So let's get back to the story. When Lord Rama asks Hanuman to go on a reconnaissance mission to Lanka to see if Sita is safe, Hanuman asks Rama, how will she trust me that I'm your messenger? After all, I'm an ape, to which Rama gives Hanuman a ring, a ring that only Sita will recognize because she knows. He also gives some information incidents between Rama and Sita that can only be understood by Sita. Now, with this ring in hand, Hanuman carries his claim to truth, claim to justice, and claim to sincerity along with the message that he wants to take and flies off to Lanka. When he goes to Lanka, he, he sees Sita trapped in a clearance in the forest and taunted and ill-treated, and she's distraught. Hanuman approaches her very kindly, but Sita thinks she is some sort of something, an apparition that she's seeing, and it could be a magic trick from the people around her. However, Hanuman delivers the message and gives her the ring and also recites those certain incidents of the past from Rama and Sita that would assure her that he's genuine because it has the combination of speech act and communicative action theory, the message, the intention, the felicity, and all the claims that are within the theory. And she's convinced. She's convinced that Rama will come and get her and uh, tells Hanuman, please go tell him to come and get me faster, and bids her farewell. But what's interesting about all this is that at the end, Sita takes claims to power and tells Hanuman on his way out, don't cause a ruckus like an ape, please go quietly. So there you are, you're seeing imagined conversations of the future already in the past. So this is something that we have to all take into consideration. Right. Now, I would like to take fast forward. Now that I've given you one example, one example is not sufficient. What this means, ladies and gentlemen, there may, tr there may be treasure troves, really treasure troves of, of interactions from the epics, from not just Ramayana, but from across the world that may lead us to arriving at the future. So this is where I stand and say, if we took action and apply the theories of speech act and communicative action and analyze those imagined interactions between humans and non-humans from the epics of history, which is written by the giants of storytelling from the past, we are sure to get a framework that will prepare us for a harmonious relationship with our future intelligence. The intelligence that we as human beings will be creating, ladies and gentlemen, but if we do not do that, and if the intelligence of the future runs rogue and destroys humans, quote from Hal, 
It can only be attributable to human error. So ladies and gentlemen, let's take this moment to think about it and take the step to go to the past to discover what we can do for the future so that we can have a harmonious relationship between us and the future intelligence. With that, I thank you very much.